It's about 10 o'clock on Friday, uh, June 14th, 2024. And I figured rather than get out there, get all sweaty and delirious and try to make a video that makes any sense, I might as well make a video right now uh, with clear thought and rational thinking and uh, good recall. Um, so my major problem right now is I have to make sure the cows are separated. I, I did move the, the bulls back to their row I wasn't able to get the white ball in the trailer, so we didn't get him snipped. But he still has balls and I cannot let him breed with my cows. Um, that would be very counterproductive. So, um, and then um, the date is, I think July 6th is what I calculated when I want uh, my uh, Red Bull, uh, the South Pole to get over here and breed with the cows. So it's, just, it's coming up in a couple weeks here. I'm pretty excited for it. The weather looks like it's just going to be in the low 90s. Um, and we have a little bit of rain here and there. There's some rain expected on Monday. Just like a fraction of an inch. Uh, just barely a sprinkle it looks like. Um, so we are in a long stretch here with no rain going into July. And uh, July and August, uh, people call them the dry months. I looked at the record um, for this area like over the past 150 years or something like that. and. I didn't see anything that made July and August look like they, it gets less rain or much less rain than the other months. And I looked at the historical averages and stuff like that and sure enough, July and August are just slightly drier than the other months. Um, we do get an average of 36 inches of rain a year, but in a particular year that can mean like 12 inches of rain, that can mean 48 inches of rain. So there's a big variance in the numbers. Uh, last night, Blue had crossed the wire into this area, so I set up a wire there, so they're near the pin. Um, and I came here this morning expecting to have to put Blue back, but I don't see Blue anywhere. So Blue might be already back. Um, the lack of water um, will encourage the cows to cross the wire. So, and there's water across the wire. There's some water here, but that's where the dog and, and this dog will protect it. So Blue. Last night when I left the field, um, it was getting dark and Blue was trying to get water here, but this dog was not letting Blue have any of it. I will mention also, uh, there was a knockdown drag out fight between uh, Snowball and Hindungi. I think um, Snowball's getting bigger and uh, his size and his age means that um, he's able to challenge Hindungi. Um, Hindungi's still the bigger dog um, and Hindungi I don't think he was very serious about the fight. You'll see there's like little, you know, it looks like dirt. It's just, it's dried blood. It's not a big deal. Um, the blood was coming out of Snowball's mouth. So it was more him biting um, Hindungi, uh, causing damage the other way around. These dogs, um, to be honest, they, they scare me sometimes um, because of their size and because of the way they fight. Um, they have uh, lots of fur around their neck and floppy skin. Let me just kind of show you what I mean by that. Come here. They have floppy skin here. And because of that floppy skin, it's really hard for um, an animal to get a good bite on them. And uh, like it would be hard for me, even with a sharp knife, to get through that skin if I had to um, because it's floppy. So it's a defense mechanism. And these dogs also have instincts. They know how to fight big creatures, they know how to fight small creatures. Um, they know where to go for the kill and things like that. So these are not house pets and I don't know if I would trust them alone with my grandkids even if they were bonded with the grandkids. Because something could go wrong and next thing you know my grandkid is being assaulted by one of these dogs. And Yeah, you know. So these are, these are pasture dogs. They're livestock guardian dogs. They're not pets. And if you find one of these dogs in a pet shelter um, hopefully the shelter will be wise enough to tell you that, hey, these are not dogs you keep at home. You can't put them on a small yard. You have to give them acreage and they have to go out hunting every morning and night. That's their nature. Okay, why is he on a rope? The answer is because Hindungi um, is a threat to my animals. Um, we caught him once uh, grabbing a newly born lamb and throwing it around like it was a little rag doll. Um, and so he is not allowed to sheep under any circumstances. Um, Snowball as well, but we haven't seen firsthand evidence that Snowball actually hurt a sheep. Um, 
I have a very good idea that he did, and he's probably responsible for at least one of my sheep dying. Um, however, the difference with Snowball and Hindungi is Snowball tends to stay away from the sheep. And uh, Snowball has been a good dog to stay on this property and not to leave the property. So he does a good job patrolling and things like that. Um, Hindungi, on the other hand, if he can find a way home, he'll come home and abandon the property and uh, terrorize the neighborhood. So he's not allowed to do that. And that's another reason why he's on a rope. This dog next to him, this is Bailey. Uh, Bailey was born uh, in October last year. And so she is now about eight months old. Um, uh, she's the only one left of a litter of seven pups. Um, and I'm keeping her for breeding purposes. I'm also keeping her because she's a semi good dog. Uh, especially around my sheep. I've caught her chasing the sheep a couple times, but she stopped when I told her. So I'm not too concerned about her. Um, the issue her, right now is that she is a dog and she is bonded to dogs, unfortunately. She didn't bond with the sheep and that was because she had so many siblings that she learned pack behavior versus, you know, flock and herd behavior and stuff like that. So uh, she would rather hang out with the dogs and the sheep and so she's going to take the first chance she gets and leave the dog, leave the sheep and go to the dogs. Okay. So she's not a good livestock guardian dog. Um, these pups that I have with the new dog, well, I'm not the new, the new pups that I have with nutmeg are half breeds between snowball and nutmeg. So they have three quarters of sheep dog instincts in them. And, um, they're a good size. They should grow up to be pretty big. And I'm going to take them at about three months old sometime in August. I'm going to take them away from their mom and put them out on pasture, probably build a little cage for them um, with some shelter, food and water so the sheep can't get to. And I'm going to have them live out there with the sheep full time and not with the dogs. Um, and then when they're about two years old, uh, then I'll let them stay with the sheep when I leave. But during the day, I'm going to take them out of the cage and uh, maybe I'll keep them on a leash or a rope or something so they don't run away or so I can put them back in the cage when I leave because I don't I don't trust young dogs with sheep anymore um, they have a play instinct that is not good and if there's not a dog out there with the right instinct to protect the sheep from the dogs that's going to be an issue so I have to take that role on myself and I can't be here full-time so when I'm out in the field I'll have them on a leash or a rope or something and then when they get uh, you know too rambunctious with the sheep I'll yank on that chain, um, have them back down, you know. Um, some people, they use a, a BB gun, an underpowered BB gun. If you don't know what BBs are, they're just like little tiny, you know, um, copper pellets. And they shoot with the power of air. They don't use gunpowder or anything like that. And with dogs these this big and with fur this thick, it shouldn't do any harm to them. It should just, you know, give them a little poke, you know. Um, I'm not brave enough to shoot a dog with a BB gun yet, but... Um, Maybe that'll happen one day. Right now it's just gonna be squirt bottle and, and ropes and uh, probably choke collars, you know. Um, ones that you can yank on and it'll tell them like, hey, you've done something wrong, come back. Stuff like that. So anyway, that's that's my goal with the dogs. And um, I am a little bit concerned that they might try to bond with me rather than the sheep. That's why they're gonna stay out with the sheep full time, okay? Uh, what else do I got for you? Uh, all the calves are castrated. Um, I gave number 27 to my neighbor. And so number 10 is his mom. So number 10 is making mooing noses right now looking for him. And she's also probably in a little bit of a pain or stress because her bags are full. Um, there might be another calf that might uh, steal milk from her. Um, I'm thinking number 26 might. But they're old enough to be weaned. They were born, um, number 27 was born January 30th. And so he is almost five months old, four and a half months old right now. So he's at my neighbor's property right now uh, making new friends and uh, hopefully he does pretty good and uh, there's not much else to report there so today my goals are to get the cows together make sure they're all separated and sorted properly and then I'm gonna move the sheep down a row and uh, feed the dogs make sure the dogs have plenty of food and water and then uh, hopefully um, not get too hot I drank plenty of water before I came to the field I'm gonna stay out of the Sun I don't have my hat so I'm going to try to stay in shade as much as I can and uh, limit the time in the sun. Um, I think I got sunburned yesterday. Um, I really need that hat. I'm going to have to go. I left it at the vet, so I'll have to go to the vet and see if they still have it. If not, I have to buy a new hat. Um, 
So that's where I'm at, everybody. My head's really big. Uh, it's hard to find a good hat that fits my head. And, um, you know, the, the cheap little baseball caps don't work. Uh, they barely fit on my head at all because I have such a big head. Um, physically big head, obviously what I'm talking about. Um, you can metaphorically do whatever you want with that information. Anyway, that's what I'm going to do today. Um, did I mention the hay? Down, down two fields, they hayed the field, they rolled it up. It looks like good hay. It looks like it was good and dry. Um, I don't know if they got as much as they wanted, but it looks like they got plenty. So we might have a good hay market this year. Uh, Grass-wise, something I wanted to talk about the grass. Um, and this video is going to probably go 20 minutes long because this is kind of a longer topic. And I, I really want to address this topic. <coughs> um, my grazing philosophy is don't eat too much grass right now. Don't overgraze, right? And so let me go out here and um, explain the two rules of not overgrazing. Well, the three rules. What overgrazing is, is leaving cows uh, on the grass long enough that they take two bites, right? That means you're basically taking more than a third of the plant down, okay? Uh, if they take too much of the plant down at once, it's not the end of the world for the grass, but it is putting a lot of stress on the grass, okay? So I'm not doing any kind of total grazing system where you graze it down pretty far, okay? Rule number two is they cannot stay on the same piece of ground for more than three days. So they cannot have access to the same piece of ground for more than three days uh, because what happens is after about three days in good conditions, it might take longer in different conditions, the grass starts to regrow. And when the grass regrows, it's very sweet and tender and the cows know this. And so they seek out that grass first and they eat it, okay? And that is probably the most worst thing you can do. The worst thing you can do to your grass is to leave the cows on pasture on a particular piece of pasture for more than three days and have the cows eat the regrowth uh, just as it starts to regrow, right? Uh, the cows like it, the grass will die if you do that. And then rule number three is don't come back until it's ready to graze, right? So for the longest time, I kept going further and further down the pasture, almost a little bit half, a little bit half past the halfway point. And the reason why was I was not convinced that there would be enough grass here in this area to support another grazing, right? I'm fully convinced now, looking at this grass, that this grass is ready for grazing. That if my cows come through and they graze, you know, not breaking those first two rules, that there'll be plenty of forage left behind. They're not gonna destroy the ground. So um, that's the third rule. And my technique uh, is currently the following. Number one, stockpile, 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 okay? For each season, I set aside a certain area, at least one third of my pasture, where I'm not gonna touch that, okay? And then the next season, I'll use that, okay? Kind of to, to keep everything going the way it's supposed to be going, right? Uh, then the other part of this technique is uh, giving them plenty of ground, right? Rotating them with plenty of ground and uh, paying attention very closely to what they're doing and what's left behind. Right? So I look at a paddock I'm giving them and I make kind of a mental note and then I come back for the next move and look at what they did to it. And if I say, oof, they ate too much, that means they need more ground and more forage. If I go, well, they could have stayed here a little longer, then that means they need less ground, less forage. Okay? And so I'm constantly paying attention to that as well. So that is my current thought process with grazing. Um, now, the current stock of grass that I have in my pasture I'd probably say it's about 70% Bermuda grass, which is what you're looking at here. This is all Bermuda grass here. Um, and then the rest is mostly Dallas grass, and that's what that bunch of grass there is. It's also called caterpillar grass. Let me show you what that looks like. Okay. I'm here in Northeast Texas. Uh, we have a hot, wet climate here. It's called caterpillar grass, right? It's Dallas grass. Okay. And Dallas grass... Um, in the autumn time, the leaves will turn red, kind of purple. Here, here's some evidence of that right there. So you can kind of see how that leaf color has changed to purple, okay? Dallas grass is kind of a warm, cool season grass. I didn't know it grows this well in the warmth, but my experience with it so far is that I tend to see it most in the autumn. As the summer temperatures come down, and as the spring grasses really haven't started growing yet. Um, there's a big lull 
and growth there between those two periods. And that's when I typically see the Dallas grass. Okay, so those are the two principal forages that I have. How much do I know about these forages? Not much, really. Okay, and um, I don't have much book knowledge about these, and I don't have much practical experience with these grasses. I've been doing this since 2021. I think June of 2021 is when I really started grazing and doing animals. Okay, I started from whatever I could glean off of YouTube and a couple of Greg Duty's books, right? So I'm very much uh, an amateur, even now, right? Um, and I'm not making these videos because I want to tell you how to graze. I'm making them to document what I did and what happened, okay? In this particular climate, on this particular piece of ground, okay? So you take this information and do with it what you will. There's a good chance you're gonna ignore most of it, and I'm fine with that. Um, uh, if there's something useful or something uh, interesting, maybe you tell people what that is. Uh, so I can identify that, hey, I did something right or something good. And obviously, if you have suggestions, you can make as many suggestions as you want. Um, you probably know much more about cows and animals and grazing than I ever will. So anyway, guys, have a great day. Take care and bye-bye.